my mother and my grandparents and maybe the puppies. And I love this picture. I, I don't even know who's taking I think it's my dad taking a picture. But um, my grandparents, this is priceless. I'm like, hey, what's going on? But my mom is just so happy to hold me. And it's just a beautiful um, image to have. Still, we often have complicated relationships with our mothers. We want our mothers to nurture us and to guide us, support us and nourish us, to always be there when we need them, always forgive when we lash out at them, to be vulnerable and impervious, right? But in a recent Time.com article, women did everything right, then work got greedy. Work got greedy. It states that American women of working age are the most educated ever, which is a good thing. Yet it's the most educated women who face the biggest gender gaps in seniority and in pay. At the top of their fields, they represent just 5% of big company chief executives and a quarter of the top 10% of earners in the United States. But then these same jobs, in order to advance, one must, be, one must increasingly work more hours. And when both parents are engaged in similar industries, something's got to give, right? And what often happens? Working mothers today, and I thought this was interesting and it seems to ring true, at least in my experience. Working mothers today spend as much time with their children as stay-at-home mothers did in the 1970s. The number of hours that college-educated parents spend with their children has doubled since the early 1980s, and they spend more of that time interacting with them, playing and teaching, taking them to their uh, ball uh, practices and uh, rehearsals and meetings and uh, everyone is so incredibly busy. And we wonder why so few families find time to worship together on a Sunday morning. There's so much stuff. We are so busy. We're more busy with our families, but also more busy with our work. So we might have a complicated relationship with motherhood itself. Do I really want to bring a child into this violent world where they could go to school and possibly be shot? Do I really want to make my body go through all the changes it must endure just to grow a baby? Women die of childbirth and the stretch marks. The idea of growing a person inside oneself, seeing the alarming evidence of that growth along with the disappearing seeds and having no choice but to get that person out somehow. That was a terrifying thought first time around. <laughs> and the first thing we ask about the baby, is it a boy or a girl? That's the first thing we want to know. So maybe we also have a complicated relationship with the idea of cultural expectations of motherhood and fatherhood. Research on effective leadership clearly shows that there is no correlation between assigned gender of the student and efficacy of the instruction according to the instructor's gender. So it's not that girls will learn better from female teachers and boys, male teachers, or the opposite. They found no correlation in that way. In fact, it is shown that all students, irrespective of assigned gender, learn best when the information is given by someone who exhibits gender-neutral characteristics, showing warmth and concern, and are assertive and confident, displaying control and flexibility. In any kind of leadership position and in parenthood, this is especially true. 
So when our first two kids were uh, very young, a friend gave us the book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Has anyone read that book? It's really great. <laughs> it's by Elaine. Um, it's been out, I don't know, 70s, 80s, I think. Oh, no, 90s. <laughs> Published in the 90s. It's written as cartoon strips of sample conversations to help parents navigate children's strong feelings and engage them in conversation more productively. And the, the, so Howie got engaged really easily because it was <laughs> comic strips. <laughs> like, oh, cool, I don't have to read it. Um, ultimately, um, it is also to get us to speak more intimately with our kids. Um, it's all about hearing them into deeper speech listening to their personhood, not the behavior or the sounds escaping their mouths, <laughs> but hearing what it is that, it is that they're um, experiencing, trying to communicate. Um, by our fourth child, um, we became a little less intentional about, intentional about what kind of listening we, we used, but um, I do believe we did become more habitual in our speech, so hopefully we haven't uh, harmed Clark too much. <laughs> Because really, we uh, all along want to be listened to and we want to listen to one another with grace and attention, right? We all want that. And that is what I want to be able to offer my kids. I'm not perfect at it by any stretch. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. The scripture here doesn't say any other 